Hello and welcome back to my channel. Now, if I found myself on a desert island and I was only allowed one book to live with on that desert island forever, what would it be? Great Expectations, War and Peace, Gulliver's Travels? The truth is, with no one around to judge me, I would pick Mervyn Peake's Gorman Gas Trilogy. And in this video, I want to try and explain why. Now, picture a young student 30 years ago. Yes, it is 30 years ago, I'm afraid. A young student in Leeds University in a student flat, cold and dark outside. I'm studying literature, but I'm reading all sorts of books, whatever I feel like. I'm not just going to stick to those boring reading lists. I'm reading everything I can get my hands on. And I get my hands on this book, Titus Grown. I knew nothing about it going into it, nothing about it at all. And I started reading it. And what I found was this strange fantasy that was published in 1950. Peake, apparently, allegedly, he wrote it during the war when he was a soldier, and he used to carry the manuscript around in his backpack. And I read somewhere that actually he lost the manuscript, and he had to rewrite the whole thing. But I haven't been able to find a, a sort of fo a proper footnote for that, so that might be an apocryphal story. But anyway, I found this fantasy set in a completely different world where in this lonely, remote mountain range, there's a gigantic castle. And in this castle is a dynasty of kings, the Grown dynasty, who have lived for years and years and years. And now a new heir has been born, Titus Grown. But somewhere deep in the kitchens is a young kitchen boy who has ambitions and ideas. He's called Steerpike. And he wants to rise up the castle ranks. So he breaks free of the kitchen and he starts to swindle and manipulate his way through the castle. This is Titus Grown. And it's a strange kind of, it's often called a gothic fantasy, but I think it's more whimsical than that. It's a, it's a book full of these very rich, kind of Dickensian, theatrical, grotesque characters with wonderful names like Mr. Flay and Rotcod and Dr. Prune Squalor and Nanny Slag, and Barquentine. And that sort of rich, oral language flows through the whole book. This is real purple prose, and Peake does not compromise on that one bit. He's, it's luscious prose. He invents words rather like Shakespeare, and it, really archaic, and these, these extraordinary adjectives. The whole prose is like, it's like a sort of you find an old cupboard in an old Gothic house and it's full of rich old clothes. It's that kind of prose. It's extraordinary. And it's all set in this wonderful castle that's miles wide, that has courtyards that are a mile long, huge towers where no one's visited for 30 years, dust that's like a great big field of dust that's about, you know, 200 feet high, you know, whole towers that are given over to spiders or whatever. Extraordinary book. And for me, this was an extraordinary sensation. It was like someone had gone into my head and scraped out my soul and given me the book that I'd always looked for and always wanted. It felt like it was written for me personally. And those people who get into peak have that same feeling. That this isn't like Lord of the Rings, a kind of shared fantasy that is made into big film franchises. It's a kind of personal fantasy. And uh, it's full of all these wonderfully named characters, you know, Nanny Slag and Barquentine. And best of all is Titus Grown. A brilliant title because Titus, you know, gives an idea of royalty and the epic, you know, this rather sort of pompousness, pomposity. And then Grown, the dull, you know, decline, of a royal dynasty that's well past its time. Did I say that? Anyway, but you can see what I mean. And it's really a sly portrait of England, right? This dusty old country with its monarchy, with its old aristocracy, its old ways, you know, creeping along and not changing. And uh, you, you can read that into it if you wish, you know. But I totally fell in love with this book. I loved it so much that I didn't read the next book. I decided I was never going to read the next two books in the series. 
because it was such a rich experience, I didn't want to ruin it. And so for 10 years, I didn't read the second book in the series. What I also want to say about Titus Graham before I move on to the second book is that though this is a sort of whimsical, almost childlike fantasy, it shot through with a strange sense of hauntedness. This is a book in which a butler watches a young woman quietly commit suicide in the dying rays of the afternoon sun. She throws herself off a cliff in almost silence. It's where the old king believes he's an owl and he's perched on top of his mantelpiece in his room pretending to be an owl and later he'll be bitten to death by owls who are starving in a tower. It has, it has a, a pitched battle between Flay and the chef called Swelter where Swelter swings around a meat cleaver. These strange moments of grand guignol, of horror. It's a haunted book. It's the book of a child that's haunted by the horrors of what's later to come. But ten years later, I thought, look, Titus Grown, it's, it, it's lodged in my imagination. Nothing can dislodge it now. So I'll try the second book. And I got hold of Gormenghast, which is the name of the castle in the fantasy series. Now, what happens in this? In the previous book, Titus Grown, the young heir, is still a baby. In this book, he grows to boyhood. And the first half of the novel is an outrageous piece of indulgence by Peake. He, he shows Titus's school years in, in the castle school. And it's really a, a whole skit, a pastiche on public school life in England. And it's quite funny, it's quite amusing. But then in the second part of the book, the story get, clicks into gear again. And now Titus Grown, the young teenage Titus Grown, is pitched against Steerpike, the kitchen boy, who has now got quite high up in the castle hierarchy and has become trusted by the, the main people of the establishment in the castle. And there becomes a pitched battle between Grown and Steerpike to get control of the castle. And per Peak builds this brilliantly into this extraordinary set piece, climax, where the whole castle is flooded and everyone is sort of manoeuvring around the castle on little canoes with lanterns on. It's extraordinary. And eventually Grown overcomes Steerpike. And that appears to be the end of the novel. It, it brings it full circle, right? And this is where most people stop reading. Most people read the first two books, and that's what Gormagast is to them. And it is a wonderful story. It's a great fantasy. It took me another five years, and then I broached the third book, Titus Alone. And for the rest of this video, I want to make a huge appeal to people to read this book. I think this is one of the most misunderstood books in English literature, and I think it's a lost masterpiece. The provenance of this book is a bit odd in itself. It was unfinished by Peake, and it was put together on its initial uh, publication in 1959, I think, by the publishers, and then it was revised by a friend of Peake's in 1970 because they felt the publishers had done a poor job. And that might be a reason for this book's poor reputation. I think there's another reason, though, why people don't read this book. What happens at the end of Gormenghast? Titus Grown is now the legitimate heir of the castle, but he throws it away and he runs away. And that's the last act. And that's the last act that most people know about in this book. But this is about what happens to uh, to. Titus Grown after he runs away from the castle. So this book is not set in Gormenghast. It's not set in this fantasy castle. Instead, he goes to a realm outside, which is, I think, something that readers don't like. They get taken out of this wonderful fantasy bubble. And he goes into a city, right, that's like a kind of fantasy version of Manhattan. So this is another reason why people don't like this book, is it's obviously set in a more modern age. It's not so fantastical. It brings us closer to modern day reality. And in this world he encounters flying cars, he encounters zoos, he encounters factories belching out smoke, he encounters the paraphernalia of the modern world, which takes us away from this cosy fantasy world of Gormenghast. And that's the whole point of the book, right? Let's look at the Gormenghast trilogy. The first book, Titus Grown, is about the childhood of the main character. And it's a book of childhood. It's a childhood fantasy. 
The second book is about the teenagehood of Titus Grove. And it is a book about coming to grips with your responsibilities, with Grown taking on Steerpike and taking control of the castle. The third book, and this is why people don't like it, is about adulthood. It's about leaving the womb, leaving that cosy world of your childhood and your childhood ideals and fantasies, and going out into the cold, difficult, chaotic, strange, corrupt world of adulthood. And I think that's one reason why people don't like this book as much. But to me, it is a crucial book in understanding what Pete was saying throughout the entirety of this trilogy. Because what happens at the end of this, throughout this book, what happens is that Groan comes to a greater understanding of the world. He meets a character called Muzzlehatch, and he meets a character called Juno. These characters are very important because Muzzlehatch becomes a surrogate father figure to Titus Groan, who he never had. And Juno is a surrogate mother figure, who he also never had. And it's very, it's very important, those characters are very important to the overall trilogy. And what happens is that Groan starts to see things that he didn't see when he was protected and privileged back in the castle. He sees the workings of the courts and the law and injustice. He sees people who live in this kind of semi-underworld near an underground river and are not part of normal society. He sees Muzzlehatch destroys a factory which is uncomfortably similar to a camp, a concentration camp. Muzzlehatch's zoo is burnt down and all the animals are killed and incinerated in this horrible way. Let's not forget that there are little shards of reality that shine through in all these books. The original two books are a sly portrait of Britain, a sort of old, meandering, monarchical country. This is a sly portrait of 20th century, the 20th century world and 20th century history. Peak was there when the camps were liberated at the end of the war. I believe he was at, the, at Belsen, and it had a great effect on him. And even in this wild, chaotic fantasy, it peeps through. The reality of adulthood, of experience, comes through in this book. And at the end of the book, Titus, shattered and beaten by adult life, he makes his way back, he gets out of the city, and he goes back, he tries to get back home. And he goes across all the wasteland and all the grassland and the swamps, and eventually he can see his homeland in the distance. And there's a great big rock, and he can see beyond, that if he knows that beyond, that's his home. The ending of this book, I was reading it on the tube in London, right? And I'd been really enjoying it, and I got to the end of the book as I was on the tube. And I read it, and what happens at the end? He gets to this rock, and he knows that his mother, his home, his womb, everything he remembers... Everything that was comfort is behind it. And then right in the very last sentence of the book, he walks away. He rejects it. This is that sentence. With every pace, he drew away from Gormangast Mountain and from everything that belonged to his home. Even now, I'm welling up reading that. I, I just, it actually, I was, I, was, I was on the tube and I actually sort of had to put the book down. And I was, <gasps> you know, because being a big man-child myself, you know, it was that extraordinary cold realisation that you can't go back, nor should you go back. That's the world of childhood and it's gone. And the future is adulthood. The future is the other way. And that's why coming to the end of this book is so important to understanding the whole trilogy. I know it's not as nice, it's not as fantastical as the first two books, but it's such a crucial ending to it, a proper conclusion to it. And that ending is one of the most powerful moments I've ever had reading a book. I actually, I mean, I literally, for the rest of the tube journey, I was kind of like, it really, I was, was going to burst into tears, you know. It was such a powerful, you know, one of the most simple, but one of the most powerful sentences I've read in English literature. And um, it had a massive and enormous effect on me. Apparently, Peake was going to write a fourth book, Titus Awakes. I can't imagine how that would have worked. I'm happy with it just as a trilogy. 
But um, he, he, his death came, you know, he died at a very young age, so he never got to write it. But apparently he was going to write a fourth novel. Um, but I, this is a book that is, it's chaotic, it's lurid, it's all over the place, it's, it's, it doesn't feel properly organised, it doesn't feel properly structured, maybe that's something to do with the fact that it wasn't finished properly. But actually for me, what that connotes, what it signifies, is the wilderness of adult life, the confusion and corruption and jaggedness of adult life. And it, it's a beautiful, it, it, it's a beautiful sort of corrective to the idea that the first two books are just a simple fantasy. They're far from that. This is a beautiful moment in English literature, a very unusual and unique set of books. And I really hope that you'll read them and enjoy them as much as I did. Thanks very much.